Hello, and a very warm welcome to the 7th International Conference on Men's Issues. I'm Mike Buchanan, the conference director. Along with the other organisers and Tom Caulfield, our video man, I've been working for many months to prepare for this comprehensive and interactive event. I'd like to thank the organisers and Tom for all their efforts, the speakers and interviewees for their contributions and their forthcoming live Q&A sessions, and last but not least, you for joining us. I was the founder in 2013 and remain the leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, j for mb The party was in 2013 and remains to this day the only party in the English-speaking world campaigning for the human rights of men and boys on many fronts. Our primary focus has been to raise public awareness about men's and boys' issues, including those to the side of me, and about the toxic nature of feminism and feminists. In the past century or so, feminists have extended women's historical manipulation of men in the private sphere into the public sphere. Women's prime weapon against men in both spheres remains shaming. Feminists have shamed men in positions of power into assaulting the human rights of men and boys in many areas and continue to do so. Their appetite for female privileging, especially for adult women, and therefore male disadvantaging and suffering is insatiable. Our loyal supporters, including our donors, tell us we've done a good job of raising public awareness, but we're as keen as them to move on and make a political impact. With this goal in mind, early next year we'll be relaunching the party with a new name and a new manifesto. We've applied to the Electoral Commission for the name Family Matters, a name quite unlike any other British political party, and we expect to get their approval next month. It's often said that politics is downstream of culture, which is true, but that can lead to a sense of helplessness with respect to possible political solutions. Sometimes culture needs a nudge from politics, and it certainly needs it with respect to men's rights and children's rights. Today I'll be outlining a political strategy which I believe can, and will, change the face of British politics. Along with a colleague, I stood for Parliament in 2015. It's fair to say we didn't set the world alight, despite our best efforts and the best efforts of some committed supporters. We decided not to field candidates for the 2017 and 29 general elections because there were critical issues completely dominating those elections, most notably whether the UK would remain in the European Union or withdraw from it, the Brexit option. I'll be standing at the next general election, which may be as far away as May 2024, two and a half years away. Along with key advisers, I've been considering how we might campaign most effectively for that election. Our new strategy was inspired and informed by the highly successful political strategy which led to the referendum on EU membership in 2016, which in turn led to withdrawal in 2020. I'll be talking about that strategy after I've said something about the issues on which we'll be campaigning. We shall select and present issues in a way that will attract more votes than if we selected and presented them solely as men's issues. If we're going to win a large enough vote at the general election, we need to appeal to as many voters as possible. Most people are unwilling to recognise men's issues, let alone care about the disadvantaging and suffering of men, however much we might wish it to be otherwise and however hard we work to make it otherwise. While we'll campaign on a number of issues, our flagship issues will be those which already resonate strongly with voters, issues which they already understand. They are issues which the major political parties aren't addressing and never will address without the issues posing an electoral threat to them. Only politicians can sort out the issues we'll be campaigning about. Men in general are disinclined to fight for their human rights as a class, as men, and it's surely related to their reluctance to identify as victims or even as disadvantaged. For anyone in any doubt that men and boys are disadvantaged in many areas and women and girls are privileged, I strongly recommend the book The Empathy Gap, Male Disadvantages and the Mechanisms of Their Neglect, written by the British MRA, William Collins. It's a large book at 675 pages, so the paperback edition isn't cheap at £25 on Amazon's British website or about $31 on their American website. The e-book is available to read on all major e-readers. The Kindle e-book is retailing for only £4.31 on Amazon's British website and under $6 on their American website. Collins is keen to maximise sales rather than profit. You won't even need an e-reader to read the book. You can read it on a computer, tablet or phone. Stoicism is critical for men as individuals. It's a vital element in healthy masculinity. Without it, the male suicide rate will be even higher, and it's already the leading cause of death of men under 45 in the UK. But Stoicism is disastrous for men as a class, 
because it means that human rights can be assaulted without a backlash, as they consequently are. Far from oppressing women as a class, as claimed by batshit insane feminists with their absurd patriarchy theory, men as a class have proved incapable of defending themselves beyond withdrawing from the assaults as men going their own way, MGTOWs. I'm a supporter of MGTOWs. They're responding rationally to a society that assaults men's rights and legitimate interests in order to privilege women regardless of the consequences. Beside me, there are 25 areas where the human rights of men are assaulted across the world today, almost always as a result of the actions or inactions of the state, and almost always to privilege women or girls. No major political party in the developed world today is remotely interested in ending these assaults by the state. It follows, as night follows day, that we need a political strategy to deliver enough votes to force them to end the assaults. We need to present issues in such a way that, if addressed, benefits will be felt by many more people than we're currently engaging with. To my mind, the core matter that will have high resonance with voters, and a matter which is connected to so many men's and children's issues, is the family. Our party's new name, Family Matters, makes it clear we're a pro-family party. At least 17 of the 25 men's issues to the side of me have strong links to what happens in families or what happens when families fail. In roughly chronological order, they are abortion and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, both of which I'll be speaking about later in this presentation, genital mutilation, fatherlessness, educational failure, brain damage from compulsory school sports, reproductive rights, domestic violence, false allegations, parental alienation, family courts, bias and corruption, lack of access to children, sexual abuse of children not protected by their fathers, paternity fraud, armed forces, veterans, health issues, homelessness and suicide. Our two flagship policies are closely connected, ensuring that children maintain contact with both parents following family breakdowns and reducing the level of fatherlessness, which has long been a scourge across the developed world. Around half the children in the UK will not be living with both birth parents by the time they reach the age of 15. It's estimated that between a quarter and a third of children li living with a lone parent have no contact with the non-resident parent, the father, in 92% of cases. Dr Warren Farrell is a guest of honour at this conference, as he was at last year's event. He was the keynote speaker at the first of these events, hosted by Paul Elam in Detroit in 2014. His book, The Boy Crisis, covers the crisis of education, the crisis of mental health, the crisis of fathering and the crisis of purpose for boys. The impact on wider society of all these crises, collectively, are appalling. There's also a lot about fatherlessness and contact denial in William Collins's book, The Empathy Gap. To give you a flavour of Collins's book, a section of more than 120 pages is devoted to six chapters with the following titles. Family court statistics. Are the family courts biased against fathers? Parental alienation. Adverse childhood experiences and the woozling of shared parenting the drivers of fatherlessness, the effects of fatherlessness on outcomes for children, paternity and its enemies. One chapter opens with these words by Daniel Moynihan, the late American Democratic Party politician, sociologist and diplomat. He wrote this in a report published in 1965. A community that allows a large number of men to grow up in broken families, dominated by women, never acquiring any stable relationship to male authority, never acquiring any set of rational expectations about the future, that community asks for and gets chaos. Crime, violence, unrest, disorder, most particularly the furious unrestrained lashing out at the whole social structure, that is not only to be expected, it is very close to inevitable, and it is richly deserved. Collins reports that the majority of studies on fatherlessness report negative effects of father absence on education, mental health, externalising behaviours delinquency, substance abuse and early childbearing. He writes this. Many studies, using a variety of methodologies and longitudinal data, contribute to an increasingly clear picture of a causal connection between father absence and these adverse effects. My party will, will be talking about the forces conspiring to destroy the family in general and removing fathers from their children's lives, other than as wage slaves in particular. All the major political parties have surrendered the family issue and related issues to family-hating feminists, even though so few British citizens self-identify as feminists. Following a survey commissioned by the feminist propaganda outfit The Fawcett Society in 2015, the report showed that only 9% of British women and 4% of British men self-identified as feminists. 
The feminist position on the family was infamously but accurately expressed by Germaine Greer in her book, The Female Eunuch, published in 1970, 51 years ago. Women's liberation, if it abolishes the patriarchal family, will abolish a necessary substructure of the authoritarian state. And once that withers away, Marx will have come true willy-nilly, so let's get on with it. Our party will talk about judges' failure to ensure contact between children and non-resident parents. William Collins, in The Empathy Gap, reports that in 2011, only 2% of applications for contact orders resulted in a contact order being made. By 2018, seven years later, the number had fallen to 0.2%. When the resident parent, almost invariably the mother, frustrates a contact order, it's in the knowledge she won't be punished. In about half of cases where a resident parent has refused to abide by a contact order and the non-resident parent has brought the matter formally to the attention of the court, the court responds by reducing the contact of the non-resident parent. There is therefore a very strong incentive for the non-resident parent, almost always the father, to not apply for contact orders. Long story short, mothers who wish to keep their ex-partners out of their children's lives have the active support of the family courts in achieving their objective. We'll be talking about corrupt lawyers making money out of human misery and, adv and advising clients, usually women, to make false allegations against former partners in order to gain leverage in the family courts. One of the silver bullets which Greg Ellis, an English Hollywood actor and a guest of honour at this conference, describes so well in his excellent book, The Respondent, Exposing the Cartel of Family Law. We'll be talking about corrupt social workers and others who deem it their mission in life to enable mothers and the courts to deny children access to their fathers. Our flagship policies will include the basic human rights of children and their parents and other relatives, grandparents among them, to maintain regular contact following family breakdowns. Denying children access to both their parents is nothing less than child abuse, as well as abuse of a parent, grandparents and others. Usually it's the father who's denied access, of course, and we know it's a major driver of the already high male suicide rate. The use of false allegations of domestic abuse and sexual abuse to prevent children seeing a parent, usually the father, must end through the police and the criminal courts swiftly investigating and ruling on allegations rather than the family courts, which are not qualified to conduct investigations. The corruption of due process by lawyers and others for personal financial gain and ideological purposes must end. Fatherless needs to be consigned to the dustbin of history. It's only reasonable that our rights should be limited by the impact our actions and inactions have on others, including children. With rights should come responsibilities, but the whole history of the women's movement has been one of women acquiring rights without responsibilities. Feminism is the pursuit of female supremacy, female power without responsibility. So it was inevitable that after men granted women the legal right to harm and even kill their unborn children without punishment, the result has been human rights violations on a scale with no parallel in human history. The violations have long been happening on such a huge scale that there is no choice but to remove women's rights to kill or harm their unborn children. That's why my relaunch party will have strong positions on abortion and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD, two issues I'll be talking about later in this presentation. So long as we continue to see abortion and FASD as women's issues rather than as human issues, the genocide will continue. As Paul Elam has said, one mark of a man's character is his willingness to say no to women. In these areas, men, and women come to that, must firmly say no to women as a class. That's enough about the issues we'll be campaigning about, for now. I turn to the political strategy of the relaunched party. I return to Brexit, the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union. For non-British viewers, I should explain that British viewers elect MPs by the first-past-the-post system. Since the end of the Second World War, the governing party has always been either the Conservative Party or the Labour Party, with the exception of one Conservative-led coalition with the Liberal Democrats. The UK joined the European Economic Community, the EEC, widely known as the Common Market, in 1973. Two years later, the British people voted in a referendum to remain in the Common Market, I was 17 years old, two years to vote, at the time of that referendum. The common market was presented to the European citizens as an economic union, but in reality it was always intended to be a political union. Powers were increasingly devolved to it by the British Parliament and other national parliaments, and it was renamed as the European Union, the EU, in 1993. 
The great British people didn't have the opportunity to accept or reject membership until the national referendum in 2016, 43 years after joining the common market. I was 58 and it was the first opportunity I'd had to vote in a referendum on EU membership. The majority of politicians in all the major parties were in favour of remaining in the EU. I turn now to the story of one remarkable man and his two political parties. Nigel Farage, a man who enjoys the occasional alcoholic drink, is a former metals trader in the City of London. He did more than anyone to deliver Brexit and thereby change the course of the nation's history. He had and still has his critics, but even they can't claim he was ineffective politically. Born in 1964, Farage had been a prominent Eurosceptic since the early 1990s. He was a founding member of the UK Independence Party, UKIP, having left the Conservative Party in 1992 after the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, which furthered European integration. He was elected a member of the European Parliament for South East England in the 1999 EU elections and re-elected in four later elections. Philip Davis, the Conservative MP who has spoken at three of these conferences, was first elected an MP in 2005. Not long afterwards, he became the first MP to call in Parliament for the EU to withdraw from the EU. It took only 11 years for his call to be answered with a referendum and another four years before Brexit. Farage's first term as the leader of UKIP started the next year in 2006. He led the party through the 2009 European elections when it won the second highest share of the UK popular vote with over 2 million votes. In 2013, David Cameron, the Conservative Prime Minister, declared that if his party won the next general election, due to be held in 2015, the government would hold an in-out referendum, despite being personally a strong supporter of EU membership. There is no doubt that the threat of UKIP candidates to Conservative candidates at the 2015 general election was the reason David Cameron agreed to hold that referendum. The Conservatives duly won the 2015 general election with a manifesto commitment to offer a referendum on EU membership and set a date for it in the following year. Nigel Farage was a prominent figure in the campaign for Brexit and in the largest ever popular vote in the UK, 52% of those who voted, voted for Brexit. The story of what happened between the referendum in 2016 and the withdrawal from the EU in 2020 is complicated and the details aren't relevant to this talk. Long story short, the pressure on the Conservative government from Nigel Farage and his parties, firstly UKIP and later the Brexit party, resulted in Brexit finally happening in 2020. Despite changing the course of British history, the number of Brexit Party candidates elected as MPs in the 2019 general election was exactly the same number as my own party's candidates in 2015. Zero. The key take-home lesson from this short history lesson is this. A minor political party can harness the will of voters to force the major parties to do things they wouldn't otherwise do, without having candidates elected as MPs. The minor party must harness voters' righteous anger at the actions and inactions of the major parties. My party will work tirelessly to attract enough votes to force the major parties into committing to reforms on children's contact with their parents and other, and other issues such as fatherlessness. It's often said by politicians from the major party that a vote for a minor party is a wasted vote, and we'll be addressing that assertion head on. Voters who share our concerns on family-related matters and a range of other matters will be wasting their votes if they vote for any party other than us. For many years, politicians claimed that a vote for UKIP and later the Brexit Party were wasted votes. They were proved wrong then, and they'll be proved wrong again by our party. For an example of individuals who get elected for minor parties, I turn now to Peter Davis, Philip Davis's father. Peter had no background in politics, when he stood for the English Democrats party in the mayoral election in Doncaster in Yorkshire in 2009 at the age of 61. His manifesto commitments included halving the salary he would draw as mayor and he was duly elected for a four-year term. I'm 63. One of my manifesto commitments for the next general election will be that if elected I shall donate half my post-tax income as an MP to local good causes such as organisations supporting the street homeless, 90% of whom are men. Street homelessness reduces life expectancy by an average of 30 years. In time, the new party will develop into a national party with a large number of candidates. At the next general election, I shall stand in my adopted hometown for the past 25 years, the market town of Bedford, so good they only had to name it once. 
Bedford happens to be the perfect seat in which to stand. For the past hundred years, the seat has always returned Conservative or Labour MPs, usually Conservatives, and the runners-up have always been either the Conservative or the Labour candidates. According to the last census, around 8% of Bedford citizens are Muslims. At the 2017 general election, Mohamed Yazin, the Muslim Labour candidate, was elected as the MP with a majority of 789 votes. I met with him shortly after that election and asked him what Muslims should do if there was a conflict between their religion or culture and the law of the land. He smiled and told me confidently that Muslims must obey the law of the land. I then explained to him that carrying out non-therapeutic male circumcision, male genital mutilation or MGM, has been a crime since at least the passing of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, being the infliction of bodily harm without informed consent. No exceptions to the law are permitted for religious or cultural considerations in England and Wales, and it would re require a parliamentary override for MGM to be legal. No such override has ever been passed, so carrying out MGM is without question a crime. Muslims carry out the genital mutilation of their sons as frequently as Jews in the UK. Mr Yazin, no longer smiling, told me he'd research the matter and respond to me in due course. I need hardly tell you that I haven't heard from him since that day four years ago. Mr Yassin's majority was reduced to just 145 votes at the 2019 general election. My expectation is that with a focus on family-related issues, I shall secure enough votes to change the outcome of the election in Bedford, thereby demonstrating the effectiveness of the strategy. When the party becomes a national party in later years, fielding many more candidates, it will have the potential to change the overall outcome at general elections. To discourage us from fielding candidates in the marginal seats they hope and need to win, the major parties will have to commit to policies on family-related issues, many of which are men's and boys' issues, as we've seen. The relaunched party will change the face of British politics, and we need your support. You don't have to be a British citizen to become a party member or otherwise support us financially. You can send a donation or maybe start a monthly subscription, perhaps for party membership, from £5 per month through the link above. I turn now to two men's issues which are poorly understood and too seldom talked about by MRAs, abortion and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD. Soon after the fact their pregnant is discovered, women are warned by doctors and nurses about the risks to the mental and physical well-being of their babies if they drink during pregnancy, but many continue to drink anyway. Women knowingly risk inflicting grievous bodily harm on their unborn children, safe in the knowledge they will suffer no punishment for harming them. Symptoms of FASD can include an abnormal facial appearance, short height, low body weight, small head size, poor coordination, behavioural problems, learning difficulties and problems with hearing and sight. Those affected are more likely to have trouble with school, the legal system, consumption of alcohol and other drugs, and there are other areas of high risk. In an article published online in 2018, Cheryl McGuire, Research Associate in Epidemiology and Alcohol-Related Outcomes at the University of Bristol, reported that the UK has the fourth highest prevalence of drinking during pregnancy in the world. A study followed the development of almost 13,500 children born in the west of England in the early 1990s. Using a wide range of information on their development and their mother's reported drinking in pregnancy, many of the mothers would surely have reported lower figures than the reality. A team developed a screening tool and found that up to 17% of children, one in six children, had features consistent with FASD. These children had evidence of being exposed to alcohol in pregnancy and had problems with at least three different areas of learning and behaviour. Some children also had physical features of FASD, but most didn't. FASD is, therefore, a relatively hidden disability. Drinking in pregnancy was common in the early 1990s. Up to 79% of mothers reported drinking alcohol in pregnancy and a quarter of mothers reported binge drinking. Guidance has since changed to recommend abstinence throughout pregnancy, but rates of prenatal alcohol exposure in the UK have remained high and binge drinking has increased. Recent estimates suggest that three quarters of women in the UK drink during pregnancy, with one third drinking at binge levels. This suggests that FASD is a problem that could affect many people in the UK today, directly and indirectly. Consistent with the team's findings, international studies suggest that FASD is the leading cause of developmental disability worldwide. In South Africa, up to 28% of children can be affected. 
Apart from human suffering and disability, the cost of wider society include financial costs. 20 years ago in the United States, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimated that the average cost per child with FASD was $2 million. FASD is associated with over 400 physical and mental health conditions. The societal and economic costs associated with FASD are considerable. People with FASD are at risk of other problems in later life, including alcohol and drug problems and trouble with the law. As always, when women aren't held properly accountable for their actions and inactions, which is usually the case, it's others who will pay a terrible price. I turn now to the issue of abortion. The feminist mantra, my body, my choice, is a ridiculous one on so many levels. Because only women can get pregnant, they should obviously bear the responsibility to care for their unborn children, not have the right to kill them. When we drive our cars with passengers, we don't think we should have the right to kill the passengers using the mantra, my car, my choice, do we? Beside which, the child inherits half of its DNA from its mother, half from its father. An unborn child is genetically, at least, no more part of its mother's body than part of its father's body. Six out of ten of all unintended pregnancies and three out of ten of all pregnancies end in induced abortions. Abortion is the reason we have population decline in so many countries in the developed world. It's an extreme form of proxy violence, women getting others to kill their unborn children, usually at no financial cost to themselves. Since most income tax is paid by men, it's men whose taxes mainly fund abortions. At the Chicago conference in 2019, I became the first speaker at an ICMI to present the issue of abortion as a men's issue, and it's an issue I've long felt strongly about. Men have historically been the protectors of the weak and defenceless, but their sense of duty deserts them when it's women who are harming and even killing the weak and defenceless, and those affected are unborn children. Men turn a blind eye to the exercising of violence by the powerful over the innocent, and it's time they stopped turning a blind eye. I was pleased to see a pro-life men's march on Washington, D.C. recently. Since the passage of the Abortion Act in 1967, 54 years ago, well over 10 million unborn children have been killed in the UK in the very places they should be safest, their mother's wombs. Across the world, this is a genocide with no end in sight. As the prime enablers of abortion worldwide, feminists have blood on their hands. It's estimated by the World Health Organization that over 73 million unborn children were killed in 2020 alone. The abortion bill was introduced in 1967 by the then 29-year-old Liberal MP David Steele as a private member's bill, but it was backed by the Labour government at a time when the overwhelming majority of MPs were men, and of course, abortion hadn't been in the Labour Party's general election manifesto. No referendum has ever been held on the matter in the UK. The government appointed Sir John Peel, the president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, to chair a medical advisory committee that later reported in favour of passing the bill. Killing millions of unborn children is a lucrative business for the college members, after all. Just as mutilating the genitals of boys is a lucrative business for others, mainly men, again including doctors. There was a stinking great lie at the heart of the Abortion Act, and 99% of abortions in the UK are carried out on the basis of that lie, which is that women's mental health can be protected through having abortions, that the procedure has a therapeutic value for them. There is no evidence to support that claim more than half a century after the passing of the Abortion Act. On the contrary, the evidence firmly refutes the claim. I turn now to a paper published in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 2011, written by Priscilla K. Coleman, Professor of Human Development and Family Studies at Bowling Green U University, Ohio. I'll read out extracts from the abstract. Women who had undergone an abortion experienced an 81% increased risk of mental health problems, and nearly 10% of the incidence of mental health problems was shown to be attributable to abortion. This review offers the largest quantitative estimate of mental health risks associated with abortion available in the world literature. Calling into question the conclusions from traditional reviews, the results revealed a moderate to highly increased risk of mental health problems after abortion. We really shouldn't be surprised that deciding to abort a child often leads to women having mental health problems. By encouraging women to exercise choice and have their children killed, Feminists are driving many of them to suffer mental health problems, but they couldn't care less. All feminists are concerned about is delivering power to women, even if, the, even if the people who suffer from the exercising of that power include unborn children and the women themselves. 
And what about the men who suffer as a consequence of abortion? Sometimes they learn of the existence of their unborn child before the killing, but they're powerless to stop it. They may find out about the abortion afterwards. They may never find out about it. A number of speakers at this conference will be covering the issue of abortion, among them Christian Hacking, the Parliamentary Liaison Officer of the Centre for Bioethical Reform here in the UK. I would strongly urge you to catch his powerful video and attend the live Q&A. I won't preempt his presentation, but one of the points he makes powerfully is that the majority of people who support abortion have no idea what the procedure involves. When they discover what it involves, most no longer support it. The next section will be taken up with a video prepared by the American organization Live Action. It includes accounts from an American doctor, a former abortionist. There are images of an unborn child in diagrammatic form, but no images of an actual unborn child or an actual abortion. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester medical abortion. This is a procedure in which the mother swallows pills in order to terminate her baby and it is performed up to the 10th week of pregnancy. The procedure involves two steps. Step one, at the abortion clinic or doctor's office, the woman takes pills which contain mifepristone, also called RU46. RU46 blocks the action of a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone is naturally produced in the mother's body to stabilize the lining of the uterus. When RU46 blocks progesterone, the lining of the mother's uterus breaks down, cutting off blood and nourishment to the baby, who then dies inside the mother's womb. It is important to note that even after it has been taken, it is possible to reverse the effects of RU46 and save the baby if progesterone is administered. The sooner, the better. Step two. 24 to 48 hours after taking RU46, the woman takes misoprostol, also called Cytotec, that is administered either orally or vaginally. RU46 and misoprostol together cause severe cramping, contractions, and often heavy bleeding to force the dead baby out of the woman's uterus. The process can be very intense and painful, and the bleeding and contractions can last from a few hours to several days. While she could lose her baby any time and anywhere during this process, the woman will often sit on a toilet as she prepares to expel the child, which she will then flush. She may even see her dead baby within the pregnancy sac. At nine weeks, for example, the baby will be almost an inch long, and if she looks carefully, she might be able to count the fingers and toes. After she has disposed of her baby, the woman may have bleeding and spotting for several weeks. Bleeding lasts, on average, 9 to 16 days. 8% of women bleed more than 30 days, and 1% require hospitalization because of heavy bleeding. The failure rate increases as the pregnancy progresses. If failure occurs, she will usually be offered a surgical abortion. For the mother, medical abortion often causes abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, and heavy bleeding. Maternal deaths have occurred, most frequently due to infection and undiagnosed ectopic pregnancy. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a preborn child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, that it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester surgical abortion called suction DNC. 
dilatation and curettage. This is the most frequently performed abortion and is used typically from 5 to 13 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a speculum like this. This is placed inside the vagina and opened using this screw on the side, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix acts as a gate that stays closed for the duration of pregnancy, protecting the baby until it is ready for birth. The abortionist uses a series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness and inserts them into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the baby resides. The baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about 9 inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeezed through this tubing down into the suction machine, followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion, essentially pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. The curette is basically a long-handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the speculum is removed and the abortion is complete. The risks of suction DNC include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a preborn child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, that it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or D&E. A D&E is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. But babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard 
in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, and it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a third trimester induced abortion which is performed at 25 weeks to term. At this point the baby is almost fully developed and viable, meaning he or she could survive outside the womb if the mother were to go into labor prematurely. Because the baby is so large and developed, this procedure takes three or four days to complete. On day one the abortionist uses a large needle to inject a drug called digoxin. Digoxin is generally used to treat heart problems, but a high enough dosage of digoxin will cause fatal cardiac arrest. The abortionist inserts the needle with the digoxin through the women's abdomen or through her vagina and into the baby, targeting either the head, torso, or heart. The baby will feel it. Babies at this stage feel pain. When the needle pierces the baby's body and the digoxin takes effect, the life of the baby will end. The abortionist then inserts multiple sticks of seaweed called laminaria into the woman's cervix. They will slowly open up the cervix for delivery of a stillborn baby. While the woman waits for the laminaria to dilate her cervix, she carries her dead baby inside of her for two to three days. On day two, the abortionist replaces the laminaria and may perform a second ultrasound to ensure the baby is dead. If the child is still alive, he administers another lethal dose of digoxin. The woman then goes back to where she is staying while her cervix continues to dilate. If she goes into labor and is unable to make it to the clinic in time, she will give birth at home or in a hotel. In this case, she may be advised to deliver her baby into a bathroom toilet. The abortionist then comes to remove the baby and clean up. If she can make it to the clinic, she will do so during her severest contractions and deliver her dead son or daughter. If the baby does not come out whole, then the procedure becomes a D&E, a dilation and evacuation, and the abortionist uses clamps and forceps to dismember the baby piece by piece. Once the placenta and all the body parts have been removed, the abortion is complete. Late-term abortions have a high risk of hemorrhage, lacerations and uterine perforations, as well as a risk of maternal death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix.
As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. Thank you for your time. I will no longer do any more abortions. When you finally figure out that killing a baby that big for money is wrong, that it doesn't take you too long to figure out it doesn't matter if the baby is this big or this big or this big or maybe even this big, it's all the same. And I haven't done any since then and I never will. What happens when a man attempts to kill a baby? Two months ago, Jamal Bailey, a 21-year-old British man, was convicted of attempting to murder a newborn child by adding his prescription drug to her feed bottle. The girl appears to have escaped the incident unharmed, thankfully. Bailey was given a 25-year prison sentence. The acceptance of abortion and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and family breakdown and fatherlessness and more are indicators that the West lost its moral compass many years ago. A civilised society does not kill its unborn children. It's time to recover our moral compasses, starting inevitably with men. I recently listened to the Bob Dylan song, Blown in the Wind, which was recorded in 1962, 59 years ago. It struck me that much of the lyric could have been written yesterday with respect to the 73 million unborn children killed last year. My thanks to the wonderful Professor Janice Fiamengo for reading out part of the lyric for us shortly, and my thanks to you for watching this video. I hope you'll be able to attend my live Q&A, which follows this, and I hope you'll enjoy the conference. Thank you for joining us, and take it away, Janice. How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? Yes, and how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? Yes, and how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many years can a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times can a man turn his head, pretending he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Mm -hmm.